So yeah, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed your dinner. Um, so my name is Joe Janssen. I work for ASMO. Who doesn't know ASMO? It's basically a big company and probably the processor and maybe even the memory in your phone and in your laptop are created on machines from ASMO. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. But uh, this talk is not about that. We're going to talk about uh, Java upgrades. Uh, but first, maybe a very important question, because uh, uh, yeah, Java version is always a discussion topic. Um, so I'm wondering what version you're using in your customer products. So not in your Hello World hobby project, but what do you do professionally? Is anyone already using Java 17 in professional products? Ah, and you guys can do this talk. <laughs> so let me know if you have something to add. Um, who's on 11? Okay, eight, older than eight. Ah, nice, that's already an improvement because I gave this talk a couple of times where people were still on older versions than eight. Um, and so that's also a reason why I, I give this talk. Uh, I think for many people, uh, there are various reasons why people aren't yet on a new version, uh, but one of them is because it's sometimes seen as something which is a lot of work. Um, and I try to explain that that's actually quite okay. And if you have any questions in between, please feel free to interrupt me. You don't have to wait until the end. I'm um, comfortable taking questions at any time. Um, if you have questions later, feel free to, uh, to also approach me. Uh, the presentation is based on a GitHub repository. I will also later show that one. Uh, that basically contains examples uh, for all the changes that I've seen in the various Java versions. And also basically the errors that you will get uh, and the fixes for those errors. So if you're actually upgrading to Java 17, uh, that might be helpful. Um, yeah, so uh, I didn't got all this information from Google. I actually upgraded many uh, Java projects uh, uh, from 8 to 11, from 11 to 17, and various other uh, versions. Um, so I did this quite a, uh, a lot of times. Uh, but still, of course, Google is your best friend, because if you encounter any issues, uh, probably you will find the answer there. Um, uh, so this experience, uh, this is, session is based on an experience for real projects, not only Hello World, but real production uh, products, and also some feedback I got from other people who also upgraded their applications to Java 70. Um, so yeah, why should you actually upgrade? Uh, yeah, performance improvements, that's also always a bit of a topic. Yeah, what's the performance improvement? Because it's not like that you can say to your manager, if we go to 17, then our application is 10% faster. You don't know that. It depends on your application, how you configure it, and everything. But it should at least be uh, faster than the older version. Uh, security fixes, probably for most enterprises, also a, a good reason. I still hope that they stop supporting Java 8 with minor updates, because then hopefully some enterprises will move easier to 11 or 17. Um, but I think for us developers, most important is that we can use cool new features like your records, the pattern matching. Um, now, for instance, you have the, the useful null pointers exception where no longer you simply get like uh, this line, there is a null pointer exception. Good luck finding out which object was null, uh, but it actually says which object was null on that line. Um, and I think nowadays, I mean, yeah, there are so many vacancies, you can choose where you work. Probably it's also a good idea as a company to make sure you have a bit of a current stack uh, to keep an attract them, please. So um, this shows basically how much uh, the performance improved in this case uh, for the committed uh, memory. So uh, let's see, the highest one is Java 16, then the purple one is Java 17, and the yellow one is Java 18. So in this case, it's uh, um, faster. Now, of course, don't trust any statistics. You haven't falsified yourself. Uh, it really depends on your use case, your app. Do you have like a web application or batch processing or whatever? Uh, so always, if you want to know this, simply run a, a proper performance test with the two different versions. Um, so what are some reasons to not upgrade? Uh, it, it can take quite some time. Uh, you have to update the various uh, environments, not only your local machine, but also the build environment, production environment, etc. It can be quite a bit of work. Um, something else that uh, a lot of people are saying is like, yeah, but if I upgrade uh, to a version higher than eight, I have to use the Java module system and that's complex and I don't want to use that. Uh, yeah, the good news is you don't have to use it. And actually like 99% of all projects don't use it. Uh, it's an optional feature. You don't have to explicitly configure your application to use it. Uh, lately, it's actually getting a bit more traction because Spring is internally uh, starting to make use of modules. 
probably also to better support things like Graal VM and fast startup times because it has some advantages to use uh, modules, uh, but it also adds some complexity. So I think like most applications will stay away from modules for now. Um, the other case is uh, some software is written and then you don't run it on your AWS cloud, but you have to run it on premise at a customer or maybe in a, a AWS cloud from your customer. Uh, and maybe there, there's only an old version of Java running. And for that, there's actually uh, quite a nice way to work around it. And that's called uh, the multi-release uh, jar, which is already in Java for quite a while, um, but it's relatively unknown. So uh, I think it's a nice example to quickly show. So. Here you can see we have basically two stu student classes, one in the normal java.com uh, folder structure and one in the java17.com folder structure. But let's simply look at it in an IDE because that's probably nicer. And so it's a pretty straightforward project. See, so we have here the java17 one. But first look at the normal student one. So this is a plain Java class, probably looks familiar, else you wouldn't end up at a Java meetup, I guess. Um, so some relatively standard stuff. We check, for instance, if it, there is a blank name with some little bit of code. So that's it, huh? just a normal class. This runs on basically any version of Java. And then we have the Java 17 one, which is actually a record. So this is a new feature, it doesn't run on Java 8. And we have the string dot is blank method, which was also introduced in one of the more recent versions of Java. Um, and the, both of them are basically in the same application and we can uh, call them also from the same application to get some information. So if we run this one, uh, I basically run it in different Docker images with different versions of Java. So let's wait a second until this finish. Oh. Um, so here we see on Java 8, it uses the implementation Java class. On Java 11, it did the same. And on Java 17, it uses the record implementation. So automatically, based on which version of Java you're using, it picks the right uh, version of your uh, source code. Uh, of course, you need a little bit of uh, magic. I can quickly show that uh, in the POM file for that. Let's see. Uh, so here we have some uh, compiler stuff. Um, so this is the normal compiler using uh, Java 8 stuff. And then we have a Java 17 execution step. We specify which directory contains our Java 17 stuff. Java 17 directory, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, there is a little bit of configuration in the jar file. So it's not really complicated. It's relatively easy. You can copy paste it. You can even use more versions of Java. Uh, so if you, for instance, now run it on Java 18, uh, it will use the Java 17 version, so the record version. So that's automatically running. Um, I think it's quite a nice feature. If, for instance, you have performance improvements or special new methods that perform better in a newer version of Java, you can put them in a separate package. And then customers who run on a recent version of Java can make use of those performance improvements. And customers who are still on an old version of Java, they should simply upgrade, but they can still use uh, the slower version. And so this is actually... Uh, uh, quite an interesting feature to, to play around with. Um, one thing that you should uh, really keep in mind is that uh, the public API, so the public methods that the class has, should be the same. Because else, if you call that class, you might get runtime uh, issues. Um, the build tool doesn't automatically uh, validate uh, it. At least last time I tried it with Maven, but the IDE, so IntelliJ in my case, uh, it gives a nice warning. And from uh, Java 17, you can also check it with, uh, with this command to make sure that you have uh, something that's working on all versions of Java. Um, of course, I wouldn't do this for like your entire code base because it's a maintenance hell basically. Then you have to duplicate all your classes. Uh, but for small improvements in certain areas, I think this is a nice trick to work around the different versions that your customers have. Um, uh, something which, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quite a fan of Docker, but especially with upgrades like this, it makes life quite a bit easier. Uh, before, if you had a build server, a lot of teams were using the same build server, so you had to either configure it with various versions of Java, and it was often configured by another department. So you first had to convince them to install Java 17 and to make sure that it was running both 8 and 17 and stuff like that. Uh, nowadays, a lot of projects, they use built environments based on Docker images where the teams themselves can basically decide, okay, now I want to build it with 17 or at least try it without having to bother other teams. 
uh, and that makes it, uh, I think, a lot more flexible and easy to, to run it. And the same goes for, for production environments. If that's also Dockerized, it's simply a matter of making sure that you use the new images uh, and prepare your code to run on a new version of Java. Um, yeah, so the, the reasons for this session, I, I actually, in, in some of the companies I worked for, I, I had the discussion because one team, they estimated that an upgrade from then Java 8 to Java 11 would take them uh, three months with, I think, almost the entire team. I was like, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge and you don't know up front how much work it is, uh, but like working with eight people for three months on a Java upgrade is a ridiculous estimate. And I actually managed to fix that project in like a week in between other work. That was partly because I had some previous experience, uh, but often these upgrades is also a matter of just getting started and try it out. It's difficult to estimate upfront because it depends a lot on uh, what kind of frameworks you're using. For instance, if you use Spring Boot, you can simply update your parent POM and make sure you use the newest version. And then probably it runs fine on the latest version of Java. If you have a lot of dependencies that you manage yourself, that you need to make sure that all those dependencies are upgraded to a version that supports Java 17. Uh, so depends a bit per project, but I would say it's, it's still something that's fairly well doable and not too much work. Actually, uh, it's a good task to pick up because it involves a lot of time waiting on builds and then you can drink coffee or something else. Uh, so a bit of a challenge, but I think not too much and I will uh, show you in this uh, session as well. So I've seen in many projects that we had more or less the same challenges, more or less the same things we encountered. So I will discuss those. Uh, you might also encounter some project specific things. I, I had some uh, examples, which I will also give later that were only occurring on like one project that might happen, but a lot is uh, basically common. I use Maven, but I mean, it works the same in Gradle. So let's go on the challenge together. Um, for the ones who aren't, familiar with the new release cadence. So Java 11 was the latest LTS until Java 17 came out. In between, we had versions 12 until 16, uh, which are major versions and they are production ready. So it's not like a beta version. You can use them in production, but nobody does. Um, that's actually the case uh, at this point in time. Um, they also, most vendors only support them for like six months. So then you have to do a major upgrade every six months to keep up uh, with security updates. Well, if you have an LTS version, you get minor upgrades for like years. Uh, so I haven't seen an enterprise so far who uses uh, the 12 to 16 versions uh, for production, but maybe like in the future, now the new major version will get some support for, for Project Loom, for instance. Maybe that will give a reason for projects to not only use LTS versions, but also other versions. Um, but I mean, here you still see it's like three years between LTS versions. In the future, it will be only two years. So every two years, there will be a new LTS version, which you can use. Um, a question I often get is like, okay, the, this version is, is one discussion, like which version do I pick? Do I pick LTS or non-LTS? But then the next question is, which vendor am, am I going to pick? Uh, because I mean, uh, I'm old and getting gray. So when I was younger, it was the Oracle JDK that you picked, or if you were stuck with WebSphere, you used the IBM uh, JDK, and that was basically the choice you had. Um, nowadays, you have the Oracle JDK, you have uh, Open JDK, you have the Tamurin, uh, uh, you have a Microsoft Open JDK, there is Alibaba Dragonwell, there is a Liberica JDK, uh, and a, a submachine from SAP, and I missed probably a couple of them. And so, which one do you pick on? In theory, most are compatible because there's like a specification and all implement the same specification. So it's relatively easy to switch between them. Uh, but we will see later that there are some minor differences in some of the builds. Um, and what for me is, is the most important difference is uh, how long do they support things? Like for instance, Azul, as far as I know, are the only ones who give longer support to non-LTS versions. So if you want to run non-LTS versions, might be a good idea to look at Azul. Um, we want to run, our, our, uh, some of the companies I work for, we wanted to run Docker images. Some vendors support Docker images, other vendors don't support Docker images, or they support Docker images with only a JDK and we wanted to have a JRE. So uh, I would first look at you, like, what do you want to have? And then see which vendor fits best. And in the end, it's relatively easy to switch. So uh, we started, for instance, with Adopt Open JDK because they had everything we needed. There was a large community behind it. But at one point in time, Adopt Open JDK, it became uh, Adoptium and a Timurin. And then they decided we no longer create JREs. You have to use JLink and everything to create them. 
There are some benefits, of course, to that, uh, but we wanted to have JRE Docker images and not do the building ourselves. So we decided to, to go to Liberica JDK, uh, which still provided them, and we could quite easily swap uh, between those two. Um, and so unless you use specific features, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to switch them. And uh, if we upgrade, what do we actually need to upgrade? So we're running on Java, and on top of Java, we have some application code, I guess. And unless you wrote the entire application yourself, you probably also have some dependencies. And yeah, then Java removes something and you need to fix something either in your application code or in your dependencies. Um, and actually, like uh, some people say, a lazy developer is a smart developer. If you wait, your dependencies are already fixed for you. So you simply upgrade to the latest version of your dependency and you're good to go. Uh, often that uh, yeah, it depends a bit, of course, if your dependency is under active development or if it's some obscure dependency. But if they're under active development, often already during uh, beta releases of Java, they will upgrade the dependencies and, and fix the issues. So when I did upgrades, yeah. I'm actually getting things why you can't just use your own dependency. Like, is there other cases where it will not work? Uh, that's a good question. Can you, why can't you use uh, the older version of your dependencies? Um, for instance, if Java removed a method, and the old version of your dependency is using that method. Mm -hmm. And we will later see that Java is also, um, uh, it has internal code and they want to hide it away more and more. Uh, the more they hide it away, the more the frameworks that depend on it and the libraries, they will break. So that's basically the main reason. Yeah, good question. Um, and actually when I talk about deleting, often it's not really deleting because Java in general deprecates stuff. So basically they mark it for removal. Uh, this is an example, Jugs B. Um, so in 9, it was deprecated. You get warnings. If you then already fix it and simply use the correct uh, uh, solution, uh, then by the time it's actually removed, I mean, you have already solved your issue. And uh, that's, in many cases, uh, the way it works. Um, now, what can be removed? It can actually be anything related to Java. So it's not only like methods. It can be things like certif certificates or complete applications, even like uh, Java Mission Control. Who has used Java Mission Control already? Not many people. I can really recommend it. So you have Java Mission Control and Java Flight Recorder, uh, tools basically to profile your application and get better insights into your application. Uh, nowadays, they're for free. Before, they were part of the JDK. Now you need to install them manually, so we will see later. Uh, but that's relatively easy. Yeah. One thing, one caveat that I know, maybe they fixed this since then. Probably not, because the Flight Recorder is in Oracle. If you use the uh, OpenJ9, uh, JVM instead of the uh, hotspot one, uh, it generate the, uh, the the the, uh, the data the, um, uh, the dump the dump format is not compatible with the uh, with, uh, with the mission control or the flight recorder. So if you want to use yeah. mission control or the flight recorder, you need to use the hotspot. So. That's a good one. Yeah, you indeed yeah. the where you run mission control and the application you're analyzing also need to run on the same type of JVM, the same version. So both need to run on eight or something like that. So there are indeed some restrictions, um, but this tool is actually capable of analyzing even production environments with only a low percentage of overhead, like between one and 3%, uh, because it's completely built into the JVM basically. And that, that's really awesome. Yeah. There's also another caveat that the flight recorder is a commercial license. So if you run the production, you have to pay a license to Oracle. Um, that uh, was a caveat. It's no longer the case. They open sourced it actually. So nowadays you can uh, use Flight Recorder for free on production because indeed uh, in the past you had to pay for it, but uh, it's open source. And I think it also changed the name. Like before it was, I think, Java Flight Recorder. Now it's like JDK Flight Recorder or something like that. Uh, but you can at least now use it for free on any environment. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, a nice improvement. Make sure you use OpenJDK. Otherwise, Oracle might still uh, want to get you with licensing. Uh, yeah. But I think by now everyone is using another JVM than the Oracle one. <laughs> um, so yeah, some more information. Uh, I found the Java Almanac.io. So if you want to have more information on what is being added or removed or, or planned to be deprecated on basically method level, you can see in the Java Almanac. It's probably not something you want to completely read through, but I sometimes had an issue when I upgraded, something didn't work and I was like, hey, what happens here? And then I found in the almanac that actually that method was removed that we were calling. Um, if you have trouble sleeping, probably this is also a nice resource. <laughs> um, so there, there are some more ways. Let's simply look from our browser. That's is probably it easier. To fall asleep or to stay awake? 
Yeah, depends on how nerdy you are, probably. I would fall asleep, let's say it that way. <laughs> um, so this is basically the repository that, uh, that I created. So it contains a lot of uh, information on the various uh, versions and what issues you can have, uh, example errors and fixes. Um, so that might be helpful. Uh, you have the Java Almanac. You have a different version from FuJ, which contains the same information, but with a bit of a different look and feel. Um, you have the release notes from OpenJDK, so this is more high level on the Java enhancement proposals, the JEP uh, level, uh, what's being added or removed. Uh, you have some Oracle release notes, which are yeah, a bit high over, but contain a bit more details, like for instance, what uh, smaller things are deprecated, and I think also some, yeah, let's hear some encryption algorithms and stuff like that, so this contains a little bit more detail. Um, Again, I found this basically out when I was preparing the presentation. Uh, most of them I didn't use up front, but it's nice. Uh, if you really want to prepare up front and want to see like, hey, is everything I use still supported? You could have a look at this. Um, in theory, it's for me, it's basically I do the upgrade and I see what breaks and then I fix it. Uh, yeah, we've seen that. Um, so yeah, when you do the upgrade, uh, it, it, normally it's not like months of work, but it's probably a couple of days and you probably still have a project which maybe have bugs or production issues that you need to resolve. So probably you want to run multiple JDKs or JREs at the same time. Um, so there are some different ways to do that. You can of course replace them every time, but that's a bit annoying. Uh, you can change the Java home to point to another version, use something like SDK Mon. Um, there's also a feature in Maven, Maven tool change. Uh, who's using Maven here? Yeah, most people, like in the rest of the world, I guess. <laughs> um, so then you can specify in one file what JDKs you have installed on your system. And then from your POM file, you can reference one of them uh, and, and change that whenever you want. So that's also a nice way to work with different versions of the JDK uh, on one machine. And then there is, of course, Docker, uh, which I quite like. Uh, but of course, it has a bit of a longer feedback loop because you have to build the image and then wait for the response. But I had some really weird issues. Uh, I once was upgrading a project and it gave really weird errors i completely didn't understand what was going wrong and after a while i decided like okay let's run it in a plain docker image maybe it's something in my configuration on my system because yeah you use your laptop for a couple of years and after time it gets screwed up um so i ran it in docker and it worked perfectly and then i was still puzzled like but why um, and then i found out it was some weird thing that didn't work on my windows laptop and docker images were in linux and there it worked perfectly um so basically it was working because the rest of the team where I did it for, they didn't use any Windows laptop, so I could simply push it and I was done. And so Docker is a nice way to make sure that you have a clean environment and to try out some things. Um, and even it, who's worked with Docker here? I think the majority, even if you haven't done much with it, uh, doing simple builds is relatively easy. You write down something like this in a Docker file, um, basically replace the your project with whatever name your directory has, uh, and you can run your examples in a Docker uh, image with uh, this command, docker build minus t java upgrade. The most puzzling thing for me, I think when I started with Docker many years ago, was the stupid dot at the end. Uh, you think it's the end of the line, so you omit it, but it's actually the context. You have to specify that you want to build your current directory, so you have to specify the dot. And then when you roll, roll out a new version, you probably start with fixing your issues on your local machine, then run it on the build server, and then run it on uh, yeah, the production environments in your other environments. Um, sometimes, so I, I did it for some teams where I wasn't, wasn't really involved in, so uh, it took quite some time to set up their configuration. So I sometimes did it as well on the build server, but then it's again, a bit of a long feedback loop to, to fix things. Um, needle in the haystack. So if you upgrade to Java, you can go from 8 to 17 or even 18, which is already available at once. But then if you get an error, it might be uh, quite difficult to trace what caused the error. Some errors, if you Google them, it's quickly clear. But for some errors, it's easier if you know which version of Java it uh, caused. Uh, so sometimes it might be a good idea to go from like 8 to 11 and then from 11 to 17 if you have really difficult issues. I have to say I, I'm a bit lazy, so I mostly go at once and I try to fix it. And if it really breaks, I could go to a lower version of Java. But most of the time you can relatively easily find what's going wrong, especially if you, after you have done a couple of upgrades. Ingredients. So um, yeah, make sure that you have an IDE with proper support for the latest version of Java. 
Um, actually, it doesn't need to have support for like the new language features because first we don't use them. We only make sure that it compiles with the, the new version of Java, uh, but also make sure that you upgrade uh, your Maven compiler or your in Gradle, the Gradle compiler and all the plugins to make sure that they run on the latest version of Java and not on some older version of Java, because then probably on the build server, you will find out that it still breaks. Um, yeah, for Maven, since Java 9, it's relatively easy. You only have to configure the release version and then uh, you're good to go. Um, actually, I, I think the most challenging part of all the upgrades I did this far is upgrading the dependencies. Upgrading Java itself is really easy, um, but making sure your dependencies run on the new version of Java is often quite a challenge, especially if you have some projects where uh, I've seen projects that used Groovy and Java together with, uh, I don't know, 30 libraries. Uh, they're all glued together. So if you change one, basically all the rest breaks. And if you change all of them to the latest version, it also breaks. So you somehow have to figure out which uh, version uh, works with which version of which dependency. Um, so I always advise, not only if you do a Java upgrade, try to keep up to date with your dependencies because I mean, it's good for security. You can use the latest features and a Java upgrade will be a lot easier. Um, one thing a lot of people forget is that hey, you now have really nice tools like uh, Renovate who you can run and it automatically scans your code base. And if there is a new version for your dependency, you get a pull request and you only have to click merge and then you have the latest version of that dependency in your POM. Um, uh, but there is a tricky thing if the artifact or group names change. Uh, so if your artifact is, is forked or whatever and they change the naming, then you don't automatically get the new version. We will see an example of that uh, later as well. Um, so if you want to see which versions of Java you're using and to which ones you can update, there are many options. Like this simply displays the latest version. Um, I think you can even use it, the versions plugin, to automatically upgrade it. Uh, but like I, I said, you can also use tools like Renovate to do these upgrades. Uh, there is a lot of stuff available nowadays and it's... Uh, I think a good practice to make sure that you're in a regular basis, like maybe once per sprint or once per month, make sure that your dependencies are uh, uh, of the latest version. Um, so this is actually an example where the package names changed. So probably you all uh, know uh, Java EE. Uh, nowadays it's called Jakarta EE. It's no longer part of Oracle, uh, but they, they changed the name basically. So it's no longer Java X, but it's now Jakarta. So if I simply would upgrade to the latest version of the Jux B API, uh, I would be stuck on a version from 2018. Uh, so you have to make sure that you not only change the versions, but also check if there is maybe uh, yeah, new packages available with the same functionality. And therefore, there is another plugin, like everything in Java, there is a plugin or some tool available. So there is a Maven and a Gradle plugin, which basically has like a blacklist of all the uh, version or all the names that are no longer being maintained and the replacements for it. Uh, and you can easily run it in your build uh, to uh, get notifications. Um, when I do these upgrades, I, I often advise to really do it step by step. Don't try to get like everything working at once uh, because then you might be stuck after like a couple of days, like, yeah, I'm 80% done and you have to convince your management to spend another week on it. And everyone knows what that 80% done means. You still have 90% to do. Um, and so then it's hard to convince people. But if you can say like, okay, the entire project, I can compile it now. Uh, I now need to fix my unit tests. Yeah, then people can get a better feeling of how much work it actually uh, still is. Uh, of course, it's a little bit vague, but it's more clear than saying that it's 80% done. So uh, try to do it in a, in a structured approach. Because uh, for me, I think the upgrades aren't that much a technical challenge. Most of the cases I've seen, it's more an organizational challenge, convincing people that you actually get time to do that. Um, and then when you're lucky, you get a really nice pizza. But uh, let's look at some details of what's actually being removed in various versions of Java. Um, so if you look at JavaFX, who's still using JavaFX? No one. For the ones who uh, might uh, still want to use it in the future, it's no longer part of the JDK. Um, however, you can basically get the separate downloads for it or a separate Maven dependency. And one thing you might notice here, there are still JDKs that include JavaFX. Uh, like I mentioned, all the vendors, they create a JDK and, and maybe a JRE with the same specification, but they can add extras. And one of those extras can be a JavaFX, or in this case, OpenJFX. So for instance, Liberica has the full JDK. It contains all kinds of extras, including OpenJFX. 
So if you really want to do Java VEX and you don't want to use the Gluon one or the Maven dependency, you could use uh, that one. Uh, another interesting one which a former colleague of mine detected. Um, so previously in the JDK, you had a, a small set of fonts. It was only like, I think, six fonts or something like that. Um, but I don't know, maybe to save disk space or something like that, they decided to remove them. Um, so there are no longer any fonts on the JDK. In most cases, that doesn't matter because the next place your JDK looks is your operating system. And often your operating system has way more fonts than uh, your JDK. Um, however, if you use Docker images, which is quite popular nowadays, you have, for instance, Alpine Docker images, who are really small, and they also don't have any fonts in them. So then basically, yeah, fonts cannot be found, and you get really weird errors. Um, for instance, if you use Apache Poi, Apache Poi can be used to work with the Word and Excel documents and stuff like that. Uh, they also need a font, uh, and it will crash with the fake errors if you don't have them. Easy solution is basically to install the fonts on your operating system or in your Docker image or whatever. Um, yeah, so Java Mission Control has been removed, but uh, as mentioned, you can now download it separately. I think, uh, yeah, Adopt Open JDK also uh, releases a build, and there are some more vendors who uh, release builds of uh, this one. Um, I think the, most, the, the biggest change for most people is the removal of Java EE and Corba. Uh, I don't hope Corba will be a challenge for you because then... Uh, it's time to look for another job. Uh, uh, but I think the Java EE change has a lot of impact because a lot of projects were using them. Maybe not full Java EE, but um, I think most projects use something like JugsB. And then actually, uh, you have to change your imports from uh, Java X to uh, Jakarta, and you need to add the dependencies. Um, I had a discussion about this in the past, which I think was, uh, was a good discussion. Like, you could still stick to the Java X ones. Oh. The, the old ones and add those dependencies because actually yeah, Jakarta EE it's a nice initiative but not much happened in the last couple of years I think it's gaining a bit more traction now uh, but in the past it was basically the same as the Java X one uh, so some projects they simply added the Java X dependencies and didn't change their imports that's also a possibility but yeah if then Jakarta offers new features security fixes and things like that in the future you then have to do the change anyway. So yeah, it's basically up to you. Um, yeah, if we look at it, it, it's relatively easy. The different modules all have uh, basically now um, dependencies available, artifacts available that you can use. Uh, for JugsB and uh, JugsWS, you need two dependencies, one for the API, one for the implementation. And for Corba, there is no replacement, but you can still use some uh, Glassfish stuff if, if you're stuck with it. Um, I think this was for most of the migrations I did, uh, probably most of the work finding out which of these we were using and making sure the imports were resolved and, uh, and adding the right dependencies. Um, then Java 15, removal of the Nashorn JavaScript engine. It's also, I always thought nobody would be using this. Huh? I saw it in conference talks, uh, like on Java 1, there were countless sessions about it, but I never saw it in practice. And any one of you use it in practice, in a real project or hobby? No, it doesn't work. Nice. No. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's nice. Okay. But it's not interesting. Let's call it that way. Um, so actually, when I did uh, a, for a company a lot of upgrades, at one point, I got a Nashorn exception. I was like, eh, what's this? And then I found out they were actually using Nashorn somewhere. Um, and yeah, well, I don't know why you still would want to use it. Uh, if you want to use it, you can simply add the dependency again. So it's no longer part of the JDK, but yeah, add a dependency and you can uh, still go. Um, and then we come to the part where you had a, a good question about like, hey, what, uh, why should I even care about upgrading to a new version of uh, Java? And isn't it backwards compatible? Can't I simply, uh, it was more about the dependencies. Can't I simply use old dependencies? Um, and, and this is one of the cases where, yeah, at least a few dependencies uh, broke uh, because JDK had some internals, like really low level code. And it was never meant to be used by us mortal developers, uh, only by the holy JDK developers. Uh, but there was never a way for them to hide it away until like, they introduced the module system with Java 9. Then they could hide it away. But they opted not to do it at that point in time because it would break any application, basically. Yeah, everything would break. Um, but now they're step by step making it more and more difficult to use those parts. Uh, so all the, the tools and frameworks that use these internals, uh, they will have to be changed. And to give concrete examples, for instance, Lombok, probably used by many of you, um, it breaks because it uses those internals. 
but uh, as soon as a new version is released, they often release a fix for that and make sure that it works again. Uh, other examples that I've seen are testing tools like uh, mocking frameworks, who also use quite some of the internals. Uh, but also there, uh, I think for Mokito, I once filed an issue and it was resolved within a couple of days. So even before the official Java 17 release, they had already a release that fixed it. So if you're lazy and simply wait until new versions of the dependencies are released, it's often already fixed. Um, yeah, so that's explained here. Make sure you use a new version of Lombok above uh, 1.18.20 if you are in Java 17 and uh, basically upgrade all your dependencies. Yes? There's something about reflection as well. That's simply type of reflection on the runner allowed. Yeah, I think uh, some of the... Ref oh, sorry. Um, is some parts of reflection no longer allowed is the question. Um, yeah, indeed. I think parts of the reflection are uh, in the internals of the JDK, so you can no longer use them. Uh, but for, I think, almost any or even all of them uh, have replacements created by the JDK developers, which are basically higher level APIs, which you should now use. So in general, it should be relatively easy to, to rewrite your code. And I have to say, I, I mostly see it in dependencies breaking. I only saw it once in code we wrote ourselves that it broke. It was some unit tests, which I think also used reflection. Uh, and it broke, but I could easily rewrite it without using reflection. And I think that was the only part where I had to change my own code because of these uh, internal uh, things that are getting more and more difficult to use. Yeah, I remember like a spring-based project starting up on JDK 11 and then saying like, uh, using illegal reflection-based stuff, this will be removed later, something like that. Uh, yeah, indeed, Spring uh, uses quite some reflection and I think the but Spring regularly updates to the latest version of Java. So if you are on the latest version of Spring, normally uh, you don't have any issues with it. Um, and there, there is actually also a workaround, which, yeah, I show it, but I find it a bit dirty. I mean, people put a lock on the door and you basically remove the lock. Uh, so in your compiler, you can spy, specify some arguments. Basically, this is all closed and now you say, I want to open it up. And I don't use modules, that's why it's all unnamed to the module where it's opened up to. Um, but this way you can basically still use those features. But like I mentioned, I wouldn't uh, do it. Another one, which is even uh, dirtier, is uh, basically start Java with a minus minus illegal access uh, flag. Then uh, basically it does the same as the slide before, but basically opens up uh, everything at once. Um, yeah, It's nice maybe for now, but uh, as we will see, uh, it will get you into trouble uh, later. Um, yeah, maybe it's good to show, like, for job 16, Lombok, you get errors like this. Like, cannot access class because module blah, 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 uh, does not export to some unnamed module. Um, so this basically indicates you're trying to use one of the internals, uh, which you shouldn't use. And then, yeah, basically upgrade your dependency, fixes it in most cases. Um, so Java 17, a uh, couple of things have been removed. Um, who's still using applets? No one. I once gave this session and uh, I was laughing about it and then someone was like, yeah, but we're still using applets on really old browsers. Uh, so apparently some people are still using it. It's deprecated, so it might be removed in the future. So prepare yourself. Um, AOT and JIT compiler, the experimental ones, they have been removed, but that's basically what GraalVM is doing, more or less. So if you're interested in things like that, basically use uh, GraalVM. Um, and we actually, now we see another Encapsulate JDK internals, which uh, I will talk about uh, more next. And then there is the security manager. Who's using the security manager? Some people use the security manager, but it's uh, I've used it in one project. It's quite a nice way to basically make sure that your JDK cannot do anything on your operating system. And then you enable some flags, and then it can only do the things that you really want, and all the rest is hidden away. So it's actually quite a nice way to uh, make sure your JDK doesn't mess around, Probably a good uh, idea from a security perspective, uh, but somehow, basically, no company is using it. Um, so, about strongly encapsulate JDK internals. I explained before, uh, you could use the minus minus legal access modifier in Java 16. Unfortunately, in Java 17, that's blocked as well. So, they make it more and more difficult. Uh, you get an exception like uh, the one below. Um, so, Again, upgrade your dependencies, make sure you use JDK APIs that are still accessible. And unfortunately, you can still use that minus minus add opens, which we saw before in, for instance, Surefire or your compiler. 
Uh, so that option is still available, but uh, I would bet my monthly salary on it that in one of the next versions of Java, this one's probably also closed. Uh, uh, so then you really need to do something. So I think it's good to be prepared and uh, only use the features that uh, the JDK developers actually want you to use. Um, yeah, to give some examples of, of what what actually went wrong when I migrated to Java 17. For instance, if you have an uh, enum uh, and, and uh, it has a field with a method in it, and you try to mock it with Mokito this way, um, yeah, you get a quite a weird error in the line, could not modify all classes. Uh, so basically, this is what I encountered. I contacted the Mokito developers, and they immediately provided a fix. So if you ever encounter something like that, uh, yeah, upgrade to the latest version, and if that doesn't fix it, simply contact the maintainers. In most cases, they are happy to help you with uh, with issues like this. Um, uh, Kotlin was another one which wasn't ready for um, uh, Java 17. Uh, I, I got a really good error. I, can, I really can compliment uh, Kotlin for that. Uh, now on JVM target version 17. I mean, everyone gets that probably. Um, but that's fixed by now as well. Um, yeah, more or less the same as, as for Gradle. Uh, so I, I wasn't really that aware of it in the past, but uh, uh, Gradle is a bit more tied to the version of, of Java you're using. Um, so actually, I could use Maven already to build Java 17 projects with early access releases of the JDK, uh, but Gradle uh, didn't run on Java 17 until I think it was nearly released or even released. Um, so they have a bit of a tighter dependency. So if you want to play around with early access versions, probably better to stick with Maven. And I got this, uh, this really nice error message, which I encountered uh, in, in quite some places. Uh, for instance, Jacopo gave the same error. Anyone know what the uh, error means? Password for Java 17, right? Exactly. Uh, one more further. It's the class file major version 61 is used for Java 17. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a bit confusing because, yeah, uh, maybe you would expect something like Java 17, but there are multiple versions of the those major versions that are not in sync, basically, with the, with the Java versions. But for instance, Java, uh, uh, if you get the error, but then with 60 instead of 61, that basically means Java 16 is not supported. Um, so basically, again, it means you need to upgrade your dependencies, uh, and then you're good to go. Uh, this was, at first, quite puzzling for me. I really had no idea what this was, but uh, then Google is your best friend, basically. Uh, so then we're basically we're done. Um, uh, so maybe also good to show a small example from the repository. Uh, so for instance, I, I created examples for, for each uh, job version. It's on the screen. Yeah. And um, I have a simple Mokito example, one that's broken and one that's fixed. It's uh, in this case, it's really simple. Um, this one uses uh, Mokito 3.11 and this one uses 3.11.2. It's a really exciting example. Let's see if we build that one. Uh, and so if we build this in Java 11, everything will work because I mean, it was still open, the JDK internals weren't hidden away. So uh, both the broken example and the fixed example, they both run uh, perfectly. Let's see, where is it? Yeah, so we see three times the success. If we do the same with Java 17, I did some extra commands for Docker to make sure that caching and stuff uh, works properly, but that's not really mandatory. So you could also use it in a bit simpler way, but the more difficult commands are also in the readme. Uh, let's see, where is it? So here we see that uh, on Java 17, when I run it on a, on a Docker image with Java 17, uh, the broken one fails because the internals are now hidden away uh, and the other one uh, it's fixed because the new dependency doesn't use those uh, internals. And so I basically created examples for, for most of the stuff you see in here um, where you can play around with uh, if you want to. So now we're basically there. Now we can use all those uh, cool new features like uh, pattern matching and, and, and records where basically we did all this work for. Um, I, like I mentioned, amount of work, I would say in general, like, like yeah, if you spend a week, most of the time it's done. Like one man week, uh, you should be able to upgrade your application sometimes quicker. A um, lot of time what I see is spent in builds. So yeah, is that actually work? You could do something in between as well. Um, but yeah, eh, drinking coffee is also nice. Um, and so it's not too long. And if you look at uh, from 8 to 11, that was actually 
for most projects a bit more work. If I look from 11 to 17, uh, it's actually a lot easier. Most of the projects, I only needed to upgrade the test dependencies and then it was good to go. Uh, while we used all kinds of weird frameworks and libraries, but they still worked properly uh, on Java 17, even though they weren't upgraded nicely, which I always advise, but not everyone does that. Um, uh, so I would say for from 11 to 17, it, it should be a matter of days, basically. Like I mentioned, try to do it incremental, but also like uh, uh, we can keep blaming management for not giving us time to do this. Um, uh, but in the end, I mean, it's also for us. We want to use those cool new features. So I often did it on like a Friday afternoon when my hours were finished or nearly finished. Uh, I started with an upgrade, tried to get stuff compiling, saw a bit what uh, went wrong, and then I could give like a rough estimate like yeah give me another couple of days and i probably can fix it and then management is often like yeah okay uh, but uh, if you say up front i have no idea what goes wrong and it costs me like uh, three months then probably they won't give you the time for it so yeah also take your own responsibility in that one and uh, yeah, make sure you start upgrading now any questions so let's first hear it for uh, for you all <laughs> Before we go to the questions, first a small token of our gratitude. Ah, thanks. <laughs> so, hope you enjoyed this beer. Thank you. Something to bite. And uh, does anyone have a question uh, that they would like to ask to Johan? Please, Johan. Do you have any experience with the uh, Cassandra client? Can you repeat? Uh, uh, do we have any experience with the Cassandra client? Not yet. I know that, for instance, with Spark, indeed, uh, it's not yet compatible with Java 17. Uh, so, there are indeed some frameworks who don't support Java 17 yet. For Spark, I know it's coming in the next release. Um, so I expect most bigger tools and frameworks should be solved this year, but it's indeed some corner cases where you still can't upgrade. <laughs> I don't see any other questions at the moment. I do have a question for you. Yeah, there is one oh, hand. Oh, sorry, Volker, uh, please. That's okay. Um, earlier on, you were, I forgot the name. You explained how you can build software to uh, be a uh, with multiple implementations. Right? Uh, Multi-release jar. Multi yeah, so Multi to build yeah, different versions. How well does that work for libraries? If you want to develop a library, and want to distribute it to uh, some customers at eight, some customers at 11. Uh, yeah, it's a good question. If you build a library, uh, how good does it work? I think it, it works pretty well, but uh, it can quickly become a nightmare to maintain. Yeah, because uh, the more versions you need to support, the more of these things you will have, you need to test all the various deviations. Um, so yeah. I think it's a nice idea if you keep it like small to just improve certain features and not to make it too big because then, yeah, I think you will have a task, a full-time task to keep everything in sync basically. But I, I think it's ideal for library developers because they often support like really old versions because they don't want to break compatibility and this way they can actually support them, but also support people with cool new features on, on newer versions. Yeah. So uh, I learned a few things from your, from your talk. Uh, a tool like Reddit Page sounded uh, actually really interesting. And you also mentioned uh, uh, everybody should by now have moved away from Oracle uh, JDK. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think there's a lot to tell maybe about that. Uh, why would you want to move away? I, I actually do know the answer, to be honest. But uh, and there are some alternatives. You're using Liberica. And as you yeah. mentioned, Jasul, can you talk a little bit about that? Um... Yeah, so I don't say per se that you need to move away, but what I noticed that where in the past everyone was basically using the Oracle JDK because that was the only one. And then we got like the three alternatives, adopt open JDK, open JDK. Most people I think migrated to, to those. And now Oracle released some version which is free again, but it again is with really vague licenses. So if I think if you only use the JDK, it's free. But if you use it in combination with other Oracle licenses, you would need to pay or something like that. I think actually, since uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere in 2019, if you're using Oracle JDK on production, you actually need to pay, uh, uh, well, a subscription cost or license cost. I'm not sure which one uh, of them. If you... Yeah, that, that changed like last year. So they, they actually have a free version now available, but with uh, a lot of licensing. Yeah, and, you have to uh, keep and updating the latest version as well, I think, if you use an older yeah. version. So it's difficult. It, it, yeah. it's, I think yeah. it's difficult and yeah. all people already moved yeah. away and there's not really, I think, a reason to, to yeah. migrate back. So. I don't expect that many people will will use it. Maybe in bigger enterprise software for really, uh, if you have the, uh, like the commercial uh, stack from Oracle with SOA Suite and stuff like that, maybe then it's interesting, but 
Most projects I see, they use something else. and Probably you have a license for uh, Oracle JDK if you use uh, an Oracle product like so. Yeah. Right? I guess, but well, and, it's a different topic. And then for other vendors, yeah, like I mentioned, it's a difficult pick. I would really look at what features do you want and which vendor offers which features. Um, because I can't really give a good preference to one or the other. Uh, we, we chose Adopt Open JDK because it had all the features and we like that it's more like an open community. Uh, on the other hand, I now see that they are struggling quite a bit to uh, deliver new versions. So it, keeps, it takes them weeks to deliver a new version. And if you want to use every major version, so also not the non-LTS versions, they come out every six months. If you then need to wait, wait like three weeks, then basically, yeah. It, it, it isn't that quick anymore. So yeah, it's a bit, I guess, personal preference in the end. doesn't matter too much because you can quite easily switch between them. All right, so let me check if there's a question online. No, there's not. Anyone else? Question? Yago, what's your favorite new feature from, uh, in Java? Um, the favorite new feature the, in Java. Uh, indeed, the favorite new feature. I, I think I would say that uh, the, the most useful is the null pointer exception, which is now uh, better explained. It's maybe not really like the cool new feature, but if I look back at how many times I have uh, to debug and find out which object was uh, was nil, I think that's uh, that could have saved me a lot of time. But yeah, things like records are also really cool features. Um, but I think that sometimes has a bit of a, uh, a marketing challenge because first I think it was marketed a bit as it will replace Lombok, which everybody is, almost everybody is using. Um, uh, but basically we now found out that it doesn't really completely replace Lombok but because it's only for immutable uh, solutions. So for instance, if you use JPA entities, you cannot use it. Uh, so I think it's still a useful feature, but um, for certain cases. <laughs> so I can recommend uh, watching the video about JDK 17 from Simon Ritter uh, that he gave at our meetup a few months ago where he goes uh, all out about the new features of JDK 17. All right, so uh, thank you very much.